I want to finish my talk okay. from yesterday, which I just simply ran out of time, and talk a little about that. So I'm not going to go through all of these slides in the same detail. I'm just going to go through them very quickly in case you watched it yesterday. And if you didn't watch it yesterday, look, you can go back and watch it and then pick up from, right. from, from here where we're going to go. But yesterday we talked a little bit about what it was, what the gap is we're trying to fill. There's the normal, there's dialysis, the normal kidney. That's the area we're trying to work in. I talked about Dr. Ronco, this paper that he wrote. That's Dr. Ronco there. Uh, we talked about his, uh, who he was. This is where I got my passion for this, was from him. Uh, he's from Italy. We talked about the study that he did that I watched. It had to do with dosing, 25, 35, or 45 mLs of replacement or effluent or ultrafiltration, however you want to couch it, uh, per, uh, per kilogram per hour. The higher dose seemed to have better survival, as is what is illustrated here. So you can see group one was the lower volume. The group three was the higher volume. There was statistical difference between, between statistical difference between one and two, but not between two and three. However, you still can see survival was better with the higher volume. And I think that's because, as I'll go through very quickly again, you're removing more of the bad stuff when you go the higher volume. And that's, I think, very important to do. I don't think it would make one bit of difference for the small uh, 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 like electrolytes, creatinine. I don't think it would make any difference at all. But the inflammatory mediators, what is really removed, I think it would make a difference. However, what it's for, renal failure, fluid overload, metabolic derangements, acid-based derangements, inflammatory mediator control, what the mechanisms of action were. We talked about ultrafiltration, diffusive clearance, and convective clearance. And again, I'm going through this very quickly because I did this yesterday. There's diffusion. We talked about that. We talked about ultrafiltration, what that was and what the difference is, and the difference between diffusion. We all know what diffusion is, so I'm not going to even explain it. Ultrafiltration is when you push or pull on one side, so you're using osmotic pressure, using pressure to force fluid across. That's ultrafiltration. We talked about convection, which is when you use a, a hydrostatic force like that and are pushing or pulling, you're forcing clumps of water across with, and it's able to draw larger molecules across the pore size. Um, because theoretically, if it's the pore size is big enough, the molecule should be able to go through, but that isn't really the case because you have a sieving coefficient, which I'm going to very briefly talk about again. There's diffusive and convective transport using a hemoconcentrator. The reason it's green on the left is because that's dialysate is there. That's just pure diffusion. On the one on the right, that's a hemoconcentrator. The blood's on one side. On the other side is just uh, uh, pressure on the blood side and nothing, no, dif no, no dialysate. And you see the clumps of water being pulled across with the molecules. Uh, we talked about this, and this was very important. If you look over here at our patient, you see our patient, you see the sodium potassium chloride is this, you see albumin total protein and hematocrit is that. When you look at the ultrafiltrate, you'll see that there is no albumin protein or, or, or red blood cells, but what you do see is the sodium is exactly the same, potassium is the same, chloride is exactly the same. This is referred to as isoosmotic. So if you're pulling fluid off of a patient with a hemoconcentrator, your electrolytes, metabolites, will stay exactly the same. But your protein level and hematocrit will come up. But remember, total blood volume will go down. So your patient has to either be fluid overloaded or you have to replace that fluid with right. something to accommodate for that. And how CRRT works is, in the traditional sense with convective clearance, is you're removing and then you're replacing here, post hemoconcentration, what you want the plasma water to look like. So you're removing plasma water, replacing it with what you want the plasma water to look like. So if you have a solution that has a potassium of four, then you will bring this down to four and yet this will still always be the same as that. Does that make sense to Absolutely. you? Exactly. So it's a very important concept to understand. We talked about adsorption, where molecules, because of a charge, will stick to the membrane itself. So if you look here, you see a semi-permeable membrane. This stuff here is not coming across. 
you're putting hydrostatic force on it, you're getting some of it across, but look, most of it sticks. Mm -hmm. That is the concept of adsorption, okay? Where things stick to something. And that's really how inflammatory mediators are removed with traditional CVVH, especially when it's not uh, a, a high pore size filter or it is insufficient ultrafiltrate, lower, like 25 cc's per kilo per hour versus 45 cc's per kilo per hour. As you can imagine, the more force you put here, the more likely it'll force the larger molecules across, but yeah. you're still adsorptive uh, uh, adsorption is really the more uh, uh, common way that things are removed. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the cytosorb because that's how that works. We talked about the molecular weight cutoff of the more traditional filters, which is 65 KD or 65,000 Daltons. Albumin is 66 KD or 66,000 Daltons, and that's why you don't remove protein right. because the, the cutoff. We talked about sieving coefficient and how important that is to understand when you talk about this. And their sieving coefficient. The molecule is too big to go across the pore. It ain't gonna go. It is, with the, with the other molecule that you see there, it can easily go through, right. okay? And uh, here's another example of that. Sieving coefficient of one versus a sieving coefficient of zero and what that would look like moving from left to right. So we talked about sieving coefficient. This is just a refresher. I'm going through it very quickly. Now, this slide here is very important because you'll see here, and this is gonna be important to understand. You see, and I need to look at it closer up so I can, I can actually see it myself, but I want you to look at IL, what happened? No, back one. that was me, sorry. Okay, I want you to look at IL6, which is... Middle left. Yep, there it is, it's red. IL6, I can barely see it from that distance. There it is, IL6. That's about 22,000 KD, all right? So I want you to see that. And I want you to look at IL4, which is, let's see, where's IL-4, guys? Can you help me? Mm, I don't see. We'll look at IL-8. IL-8, way down here. So IL-8 is about, you know, plus or minus 10 KD, okay? And if you look here, you'll see dialysis, traditional dialysis is in that range. But traditional dialysis will not remove IL-8 and it will not remove IL-6 because it's diffusive clearance because you're right really on the edge of what ions can freely come across. All right, so that's gonna be important to understand. And then here's, you see albumin at 66 KD. And we're, so we're always gonna be under that because the biggest, fire, the biggest filters, the ones we use, the hemocores and the, the levonovas, they're 65 KD. That's intentional. Yes, it is intentional, correct, very intentional. We talked about the balance between the pro and the, the anti-inflammatory mediators that exist. We talked about systemic inflammatory response syndrome and how that occurs. We talked about what a cytokine storm is. We discussed that yesterday and how it affects the, the, the patient. And there's another example of the same thing. And basically, when you have a cytokine storm, you know, well, we'll talk about it in just a second. Here's a basic CRRT circuit. I don't want you to get caught up on the complexity, a seeming complexity of it. We also talked yesterday about why in dialysis, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put you on the spot, Nate. When we do cardiopulmonary bypass, we make blue blood red. Mm -hmm. But in dialysis, we take red blood and make it blue. Now we're not deoxygenating it. Mm -hmm. So why is in the dialysis world, these colors reversed from what we in the cardiovascular and perfusion world are used to? <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming it's flow path, but I don't know for, for certain. I'm assuming they're considering that your arterial flow mm -hmm. on the red side and venous on the return, but I honestly don't know. Good guess, but wrong. So with that said. That's a perfusion answer. Exactly. So with that said, if I take a sample of blood from a patient that has a hematocrit of 16 okay. and their PO2 is 90. 
Uh, and I take, ah, so you got it already. I think, go ahead, keep going. Tell me what you think. No, keep going. No, tell me what you no, think. No, you gotta keep going, because I, I may have it backwards. Go ahead, keep going. Okay, and then you take that same sample of blood from that same patient with the same PO2, only the hematocrit is 40. What's the difference in the color of the blood? Which one's darker? Well, the, the lower hematic, it's going to be darker, right? No, brighter. Backwards, backwards. Right, because that's it. It's going to be much, much brighter. It's going to appear... Because it's really, diluted? Because it's so diluted. Right. So in the dialysis world or in the renal world or in the CVVH world, you're taking diluted blood or blood from the patient at whatever that hematocrit is, you're ultra-filtrating it, and you're returning it more concentrated right. with a higher hematocrit, therefore giving it a darker appearance. So it's literally based on visual. Correct. Appearance. That is what it okay. is based on. Yes, right. that is that is it. So how CVVH works is we remove this isoosmotic fluid and then we replace that plasma water with what we want it to look like here. Now you can do it pre and you can do dialysis at the same time if you want to, but really for the most effective clearances and for removing the largest molecules, the most effective way to do that is post filter replacement. Here's your filter, the flow path, this is post filter. You've removed all the plasma water, or as much of it as you, you, you have it set for, and then you're replacing it with what you want the plasma water to look like, and boom, it goes back into the patient. Very simple concept. Okay, now I can actually get to the second part of the talk, which is, that was all from yesterday. And I took an hour to get through that yesterday, and I went through this in about five minutes. So forgive me. So does modified ultrafiltration, and we know MUF to be where you come off bypass, so modified ultrafiltration is usually when you're in the operating room, you're still cannulated, you take the volume from the patient, you run it through the hemoconcentrator, you put it back into right. the patient. That's traditional MUF, so it's intraoperative. But does it remove adhesion molecule and cytokine levels after cardiopulmonary bypass with clinical relevance in adults? Is it clinically relevant what we do? So take a look at this graph. This is a very important graph. If you look at IL-6 and IL-8, and this is at normothermia, you'll see that the level of IL-6 was basically nothing, and IL-8 was a little higher in the pre-op phase. You'll see here that at 24 hours, there was a higher level of IL-6 and IL-8 than there was with ultrafiltration. The dark is obviously that ultrafiltrated. And here towards the end, after about six days, a little bit higher IL-6 uh, in the uh, non-ultrafiltrated group, but basically IL-8 was essentially stable and equal at the end of that time. That's an important graph to understand because I have always believed, and still do, that it clears it. I'll tell you why I don't think they found it, but we'll talk about that. That's a different, a different issue. So if we look at hypothermia with the same IL-6 and IL-8, you can see what the values were pre-op, which is essentially equal, and then 24 hours after surgery, after performing the MUF procedure or not, which is the ultrafiltration group dark, uh, the uh, no, no fill or the white, is, uh, is non-ultrafiltration. You can see that IL-6 was much higher at 24 hours. IL-8 was much higher at 24 hours if you used uh, hypothermia to do the procedure. But then you see that again, it stabilized. And interestingly enough, IL-8 was a little bit higher in the ultrafiltration group than, uh, than the non-ultrafiltration group at six days. None of this is really very significant. Nothing There's no big difference, okay? These are very, that's, that's a minimal difference at best. This seems like a pretty big difference, but is it clinically significant is, a, is, 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 is really not. There's some debate, but it's really not. So, oh, sorry about that. So here's another study that was done about the same time. And it had to do with, they looked at blood loss, they looked at transfusions, they looked at a bunch of various things, atrial fibrillation rates, HOSU, hospital stays. Really, it, between the two groups, 
There just was nothing there. There was no there there. It made no difference between the muff and the uh, and the uh, non muff or ultra filtration group. Actually, it's the same study. I, I misspoke. I apologize. But in all of these things that they measured, there was essentially no clinically clinically significant difference in the patients. Okay. Now, moving on to here, elimination. Here's another study. This was the other study. And you can read the conclusions, but they found that polysulfone filters, which is what we use, by the way, because they have polysulfone filters, and they have uh, essentially AN69, it's kind of a nylon polypropylene type of uh, filter material. We have those. But you can see they were more effective at removing uh, tumor necrosis factor, interleukin-6, interleukin-10, and I would assume, and I think it's reasonable to assume, that this was mostly due to adsorption. We know polysulfone filters are more adsorptive than are the polypropylene filters. Right. Here's a study that was done on the intensity of, uh, of CRRT uh, from the Journal of New England, the New England uh, Journal. And you can see it was a very large study, 4,500 patients, so a whole lot. Uh, 2,000 were excluded, 16, almost 1,700 were fully eligible. Some refused uh, uh, the option or being part of the study and 1,500 underwent randomization. They were assigned to higher intensity training or lower intensity training, okay? Go down a little further. You can see what they were, what the criteria or inclusion criteria was. We won't go over those, you know, too deeply. And then we looked at primary and secondary outcomes. Of course, death is probably the most important one, but you also have renal failure, need for, need for uh, continuous dialysis or uh, a chronic dialysis, all of those kinds of things. So renal replacement dependence among survivors. Basically, there was no significant difference at all between the two groups. I wouldn't have guessed that. Well, me either. Here is another randomized trial of continuous versus intermittent dialysis for acute renal failure. And this was Dr. Maida. I think he's out in California. Here's the uh, uh, Apache scores at randomization. And what their conclusions were. And basically, they concluded that there really was not anything they could point to that said this one was better than the other. Conventional therapy, intermittent dialysis, or there was a benefit to, uh, to using CRRT, okay? Now, commonsensically, I'm just gonna ask you, commonsensically, how do you feel about those two studies? I'm not sure what you're, I mean, I understand the question, but I, I'm not. Well, you intuitively, you said, I wouldn't have believed that. I would have thought, given the benefits that I'm, at least thought I was aware of with CRRT. Well, how do you think there's benefit? So tell, me what, tell me what it is about your experience that you have a hard time believing those studies. I don't believe them. So, I mean, I do believe the studies. I think the studies were done. And I think that based on the information, their conclusions were valid. But that's not been my experience. Yeah, it, it, it would seem to me that clearing off those type of in, inflammatory mediator issues and things like that would be as a, a benefit mm -hmm. to the patient, especially for the kidneys mm -hmm. and other things. It may not make a big difference in short-term mortality. Mm -hmm. I don't think it honestly don't know that it would unless you had a huge hit to the kidneys or mm -hmm. other issues. But I would think that it would improve the outcome as far as uh, kidney issues. I mean, I, I, don't, I really know, don't know how to speak on it other than that, mm -hmm. Joe. So, no, that's okay. So let me tell you, is, do you think there's any chance that maybe we're just not doing it right? Doing the study correct or doing, no, doing the, the therapy right? The therapy correct. Yes, uh, absolutely. I mean, there always is that chance. I think there is too. So let me tell you a little something about the studies. Mm -hmm. When you really dive into the studies, the biggest criticism I have is that they randomized. However, 
I'm gonna show you a picture. Okay. And I love this picture. I've shown this picture several times. I'm gonna show it again though. I think it's a good picture. Think she looks fluid overloaded? A touch. Touch, yeah. She's in renal failure too. Mm -hmm. Now here's the problem with the studies. If you were randomized to intermittent dialysis for therapy and became hemodynamically unstable during the therapy, you were converted to CRRT until you could tolerate going back to back going back to intermittent dialysis. However, you're still considered in the, the intermittent arm. So you get bone, you get you get the benefits of both, which is good for the patient, but not for the study. Correct. So, and in the dosing trial, there were nowhere near the volumes that they need to be, in my view, it was run lower. to really, yes, to be effective. Even their high dose was too low. Yeah. They didn't have, they didn't have it. So here's what would happen. This patient, hemodynamic, grossly fluid overloaded. I mean, I don't think there's any doubt that those eyeballs are about to pop, those eyelids. This patient on multiple pressors, hemodynamically unstable, bleeding on top of it, not making any urine, acidotic, is randomized to dialysis. Right. The surgeon says, uh, n n n you're not doing that. And they put that patient on CRRT. So not only did they go back and forth with the therapeutic modality during the study, changing it, but yet never changing the randomization, the sicker of the patients with CRRT. all got CRRT. <laughs> so is that really a good study? I don't think any, I don't think there's been a study yet on CRRT. I can tell you what my eyes see. I can tell you what my experience has been. Right. And I've, my experience has been that the more aggressive you are with it, the better it works. It, the better it works. And the earlier you implement it, the better it works. But I get pushback all of the time that, well, you know, you're adding risk to the patient. Let me tell you this. And I've heard this nurse. before. You, huh? We're adding work for the nurse. Well, they don't mind that. The nurses, I think, are all on board. I think the nurses are excited about no, you it. Hear, that's, you do hear from the, from the attending those that, oh, I'm adding more work for her. I'm well, that's sure true. It's, it's but they have it. a machine now that reduces that workload dramatically and is just as effective as the Prismaflex. It's called the Prismax. I hate Baxter as a company. I don't mind saying it. I'll just say it. I do. I hate them. However, they got a really good tool. There you go. Okay. And for the Prismax is the next generation of the Prismaflex. And it's a really good tool that reduces the nurse's workload tremendously, but yet is equally as effective as what the Prismaflex is. It's pretty so I think stuff. it's very important. So let me change that slide because it is really difficult to look at. I feel bad for that lady. Um, so I get a lot of pushback. Let me tell you something. If you're on ECMO, all right, and you are going to put a hemoconcentrator, or not a hemoconcentrator, but a CRRT machine, a real technology. I don't recommend you cut hemoconcentrators in the line. I, I'm very against that because you can't control right. the effluent. You unclamp it. If you forget, it's going to be a problem. Um, it's just uncontrollable. And, you you know, it's very hard to then add replacement fluid. Now, if you were out in the middle of a of, a, of, a, of a, war, a, a war zone and you had to do it, yeah, you could do it. But I mean, this is, this is the 21st century right. and we're in the United States of America. It's not a good idea. Use a machine that's designed for it. But if you're on, if you're on ECMO and you're on six pressors and inotropes and you're getting transfusions and you're sick and hemodynamically unstable and acidotic and you have you have you have uh, 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 electrolyte disturbances. Adding a CRRT machine to the ECMO is not increasing the risk. The, the, no, it's, it's not increasing the invasiveness. Right. ECMO is about as invasive as you can get. Definitely, it'd be like making the argument. Well, we're on ECMO. I, I don't want to add a central line. I mean, that's just how I feel about it. It is so safe. It is so reliable, it is so effective that it should be done 
automatically. You're on ECMO, you need to be on CRRT. I feel very strong about that, I say it. I know I get a lot of criticism for it, but it's what I truly believe. So let's talk about Cytosorb. Cytosorb is designed specifically, this is a plasma adsorption treatment. Now you put whole blood through it, I'll show you how it works. And this is a, it's, and I don't know what the material is, I'm sure it's proprietary, but I'm assuming it's some kind of a charcoal based thing, uh, but I'm not sure, so don't quote me on that. But you'll see that when your innate and your adaptive immune systems get out of control, and you have first a cytokine storm, which then can lead to shock, but can also lead to essentially immunoparalysis when you have just been in a cytokine storm and then everything just drops to zero. It, either direction, you're gonna be in a lot of trouble. Right. To clear those inflammatory mediators, however, much more effectively than you can with CVVH. I think CVVH, if done with high dose, can be beneficial, um, but not nearly as quickly as you can do this. Now, interestingly enough, I heard Baxter has recently come out with a filter that they have, uh, I, I, I'm assuming they're using heparin, but they have some type of charge on the fibers now, which will adsorb, it gives a charge that will draw these inflammatory mediators to it. Um, I'm not sure the cost, I know Cytosorb is very expensive, and you have to use them, I think every day you change them for a period of time. They're about six or 7,000 a treatment. They're not cheap, they're very expensive. But for if you're in cytokine storm, you've got to get those inflammatory meteors out of there. We know what happens. Physiologically, I don't wanna go through all of the, the, the physiology associated with cytokine storm. We all know what it is and it never ends well. You got to control it. Yep. So I do think we ought to look more into the cytosorb, but I also think you need to look into this new filter that Baxter has. And I don't really know. I don't remember the name of it. I can look it up. Maybe I'll find it but uh, easily. But it's supposed to work very, very well, be more affordable, already integratable into your your already existing CRRT machine. Now, the cytosorb is very easy to add to a CRRT machine, but you can do a lot of things with it. Let me show you what you can do. So here, this was a video, but I just used an image. You can see that it draws blood from the patient. And again, you're going from red to blue. You're hemoconcentrating it if you want to, or dialyzing it, whichever you prefer. Comes down, goes into the cytosorb filter, goes through. Go, this is just an air deaeration de chamber, goes back into the patient. That's choice one. Here's choice two, where you go through the cytosorb filter first, then you ultrafiltrate the plasma water or dialyze it, and then goes into your deaeration chamber and back into the patient. This is just a typical, very simple loop, right? And you can integrate it into your ECMO where you have access coming from the positive side, going into the cytosorb, coming out, going back into the negative side. Now, the, the advantages and disadvantages. The advantage of this is obviously you have positive pressure driving it to negative pressure. That's the first advantage. The two major disadvantages are, if this becomes disconnected, right. you're going to deep prime this and fill it full of air and it's going to be a fire drill. Uh, the other is you're gonna have some recirculation because you see it coming through going into, I'm oh, sorry, going this way, going into here, and then it's returning. So some of that treated volume will end up coming back out here right. to some degree. And then it goes through your oxygenator here back into the patient. So this is how you easily integrate it into an ECMO circuit. And there's no extra pump needed for that. No extra pump, just all off of pressure, right? Because this is a this is gonna be positive about 240, 200 to 250, and this is gonna be negative about uh, 100 to 150. You may be about to cover this, but can the Baxter device be used in the same manner? The You mean the uh, Prismaflex? The, the, the Baxter filter you were talking about. Well, no, you have to use the CRT machine, okay. not in the same manner. So they're, they're, they are different in that way, okay. yes. And so basically finish off my slides, it's about balance. We want everything to be balanced. We talked yesterday at, ad nauseum about homeostasis, having the 
optimal condition of your patient's physiology to have the best chance of survival. When you're acidotic, none of your pressors will work. When you're hyperkalemic, you're gonna have, or, or, or hyponatremic or hypernatremic because you've given bolus after bolus after bolus of bicarb, right. nothing works. You start having cardiac dysrhythmia. You start having all kinds of issues. You start third spacing. You're not control, controlling fluid volume well enough. You, you need to keep this chyloronchotic pressure higher. You need to keep a higher hematocrit. Really, at the end of the day, what's it about? It's about DO2. And if right. you're massively fluid overloaded, and all of your organs are also, you know, anasarca, where you look at a patient and they're mass 30 liters, 20 liters fluid overloaded, they look horrible. But that condition is not simply a visually displeasing sign. Right. It's all of everything. the end organs are that edematous as well. And you don't get good perfusion because all of the little microcirculatory blood vessels are being occluded by the edematous state. Makes sense? Makes sense. Makes sense to me too. So it's about balance. All right, let's take a two minute break and then I'm gonna do stroke. Okay, hello everyone and welcome back to the program. Thanks a lot. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and jump right in to the next uh -huh. talk. Do you have any questions about the previous one, by the way, before we get started? No do, questions? Do you, do you have any strategies to push, push is the wrong word, but to far talking to the surgeon, not the surgeon, but whoever's, you know, whoever the doc is running the ECMO, uh, sometimes we are there taking care of that one patient where the doc's busy walking around, or maybe yeah. it's night and mm -hmm. he's not walking around, he's taking mm -hmm. a nap. Mm -hmm. And in some instances, we're talking to the nurses and they're giving us their opinions and we come to the opinion, okay, this patient should be on CRT. Mm -hmm. Do you have any strategies for trying to convince the, the, the attending yeah, that's a great question, and 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 really, I I, I really I don't. Mm -hmm. I think the unfortunate part is, is that there is a, uh, it, 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 there's an insufficient amount of compelling, convincing data um, to uh, to say, hey, look, look, you got to read these papers. These papers right. say it all. Um, I think there are people who are believers who use it well, use it effectively, use it properly, um, and who have very, very good outcomes. And it's maybe it's anecdotal, but it's the experience, not necessarily because they were part of a trial. And uh, there are those that aren't. Um, I think that early intervention with everything, earlier intervention with everything, whether it be antivirals, whether it be ECMO, whether it ECMO. be... <laughs> when you think about it, put them on ECMO. Right, I mean, really, seriously. Yeah. I mean, I think that earlier intervention is always uh, always better. And, uh, you know, I've, I've just had too much firsthand experience with CRRT and those that have been with me in those circumstances that have seen it literally turn somebody around uh, and make the difference in, 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 in my view, and I believe it uh, wholeheartedly, be the difference between life and death, um, I think that uh, you, become con you become a believer. Yeah. Uh, but you have to use it properly, you have to use it early, you have to use it, uh, and you have to use it effectively. And just doing it at minimal settings uh, it's very easy for me to understand why it, uh, why you would think it just really doesn't do anything. It doesn't really have any real value. Occasionally, I see the intensivists uh, passing that off to, and it may be the way it is at that facility, but passing it off to the, to the, uh, the kidney doc. I can't think. The also. nephrologist. Nephrologist, and the nephrologist is, oh, well, they're making urine. That's good enough for me. Right. So they don't want to do anymore, and the intensivist just takes their word for it. And I'm over there thinking along the lines you're saying. Right. We've got these other issues, and the kidneys aren't clearing enough volume to take the lung, you know, to, to help That's this right. guy's lungs drop. So That's what are right. we doing? And then two days or later, you still have an acidosis, or you're right. still oh, on yeah. pressors. And or two days later, we end up putting things. them on CRT, CRT anyways. Mm -hmm. So that's why I asked. Them. Yeah, I've seen that a lot too, where they're just very late in pulling the trigger, and then they're doing dialysis and not convective clearance with it. Um, and it all it all matters. But I think that 
you know, it'd be nice if trials could be designed effectively that really did answer the question. Uh, I just think it's very, very, very hard to do. And in some ways it's unethical. How are you gonna take a patient who truly is hemodynamically unstable? And if you put the patient on dialysis, traditional intermittent dialysis, they are going to die. I mean, we know that. We've seen it happen so many times. How are you gonna randomize that patient? You're not, you're gonna put them on CRRT. Right, every time. And so it's uh, very, very difficult. I don't think it's possible to actually do a study that would conclusively answer these questions. Right. And if you're a believer, and I am, you're a believer. Yeah. If you're not, yeah. you're not. Okay, so 